Hey, Mark, gotcha. All right, well, it's three after, why don't we go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see. So just two AIs I want to bring people's attention to. Um, Rachel, whoa, hold on, what did I do there? Rachel, any update on your PR? Yeah, I pushed up a branch, but um, Jim Day had reached out, said he wanted to collaborate on this, so I'm going to give it a beat so he can look over it before making a PR to the main branch, or to the main repo. All right, cool, thank you very much. And Clemens, um, this PR is the one about that, uh, what is it, it's the, the, uh, the key thing or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, can you, can, can you take the action item to, to really, really pester and nag people to, to yes, pester? yes, I will do that this week. I just had, I had zero cycles this week. That's fine. I just wanted to make sure that we don't stall too long on that one. So I appreciate it. Hey, I'll, 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 I'll take care of this, uh, this, I, I'll try to get people on the phone sometime Monday and Tuesday, or otherwise we're just going to let it sit. Okay. Thank you guys. I think everything else is minor. We can keep moving forward then. Uh, community time. Any community related issues people would like to bring up? All right. Not hearing any. Oh, uh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go uh, ahead. Uh, yeah. Community related. Um, I had talked about the CNCF thing on Kubernetes being made up. Uh, doing the demo there. But unfortunately, we don't have a meetup in February. We have the next one in March 21st. But since it's such a long time away, I was thinking whether if there is a preference in this group, whether we should uh, keep the demo endpoints up longer or just wait until Barcelona and do that demo in meetups. Uh, I personally have no problem keeping up my endpoint. Um, what are the people on the call? Anybody else have endpoints on the call? Yeah, we, we have one. We have the first one. I don't think there's any problem keeping ours up. Okay. So, so I would I would assume people are going to keep their points up. Every now and then I do kind of run it just to poke everybody, just make sure they're up and running. Um, and what we could do is we can just assume people will keep them up until I start seeing some drop off, and then we can revisit the issue if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, I just, like, before end of February, it would be nice to lock in whether we will hold that demo or not the meetup so they can plan their schedule. Yeah, obviously if you know for sure you're gonna need, you're gonna to wanna to demo something, just let everybody know so they don't take it down by accident. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? All right, um, SDK, we did not have a work group meeting um, or sub SDK subgroup meeting. Um, so I don't think there's anything to, to bring up there unless there's somebody on the call who can think of something that they wanna bring up. Okay, moving forward then. Kathy, is there anything on the workflow subgroup you'd like to mention? Uh, sorry, I was on mute. Um, not really, um, but I think, you know, we, we probably need to start working on this to clean up a little bit on the document to make it more consistent. So I think I'm going to probably start working on this maybe uh, next week and then propose some PR for review. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, I think at some point we probably need to figure out what the next steps are going to be with this document. Um, um, but we <clears throat> let, let's talk offline about that because I think we just need to figure out how we want to move forward with, with this thing. So you and I can talk and then we'll bring back a proposal for the group. How's that? Okay, yeah, sure. Okay. All right. Um, all right, so Scott sent out a rough draft document for the next demo idea and link is in the agenda doc right here. Um, Scott, is there anything you'd like to say about this one other than just asking people's feedback? Scott, you still there? Yeah, it's, it's, I've been having trouble with Zoom. Um, no, just please review and uh, do feel free to make changes or comment or whatever. Just, and it's an idea, you know, if you have a better idea, please uh, bring it up. Okay, any high level questions for Scott before we move on? Okay, yep, so please everybody when you get a chance to take a look at that because I think right now the current goal that we talked about is trying to get this uh, demo out there uh, in time for Barcelona, which is, when is Barcelona, May? I can't remember for sure. So it's 
Uh, end of May. End of May. Okay, there we go. Okay. First, twenty third, or something like that. Okay, there you go. So we got a couple of months, but uh, time does fly very, very quickly. I'm sure everybody is aware of that. So um, please review when you get a chance, so people can start coding things up, so that we don't feel too much pressure as the date gets closer. All right, moving forward. All right, PR review. Um, so Tapina, you did make a change to this one. Thank you very much. Um, the changes look good to me, um, but I wanted one more LGTM before I merged in. So everybody take a quick look. I believe everybody was okay with the general direction. It's just Mark wanted some editorial tweaks to remove the, we had a whole bunch of ORs before, so we just changed that in two different spots now. Give you guys just a quick second to look that over. All right, any questions or concerns with this? Any objection to approval? All right, easy one, I like those. It looks like it's not oh. changing the meaning, right? It looks like it's just rearranging words. Is that, did I miss well, it? I think there were two things. One is just to make sure, yeah. He added integer and then the rest of it was just okay. Uh, okay. wording, yes. And there's no normative changes. It, it was just missing integer from the description of the any type. It was only on the list. Gotcha. Okay. All right, so one more time. Any objection to approval? Nope. All right, thank you guys. Do, do, do. All right, uh, Fabio, I don't think Fabio. Uh, actually, relating to that PR, oh. there's also, if you open it again, there's a line above it that says this specification does not define numeric or logical types, but we do now define a numeric type integer. Oh. So let me ask you this. Should we just remove that line entirely? In my opinion, yes. Clemens, I think you might have written this line originally. Would you object if we just remove that line? Um, we can take that out, yes. Okay, what about other people on the call? Any objections to remove him? It's completely non-normative anyway. Do I vote with a true? <laughs> but I'm bummed. Thank you, Mark. Sure thing. I'll be here all day. <laughs> a little levity. That's good. It took me a second there, Tim. Um, okay, any objection to removing that line since it's technically incorrect now? Okay, Tapini, would you mind squeezing that one into this PR as well? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay. I'm assuming everybody's okay with approving that once we remove that line? Okay, let me just make a note of this so I can remind myself. Uh, once we remove. All right, cool, I'll fix that later. All right, thank you, Tapini. Um, let's see, Fabio is not on the call, but this one looks fairly straightforward to me. I think maybe we can deal with it. So I believe all he did is add minimum length to our string types um, because I believe every single case we have a string we say it has to be a non-empty string and so that's why it has minimum length in a whole bunch of different places on this particular field which is spec version he sets it to be a value of 0 0.2 which is our current version and there was one other change he made where was it here we go in schema url he added a reference to schema url in the reference in the definition section now i'm not a swagger expert so i can't Say for sure whether this is 100% correct, but it looked right to me. Anybody have any questions or comments on this one? Any objection to adopting it? No, only a question about the const 0 0.2. Is that meant to be changed every time there's a new version? I would assume so, yes. I think that's true of the spec itself. I think the spec mentions 0 0.2 in it as well. So I think this would be one of those spots we have to catch. Yeah, please add it to some doc about releases. <clears throat> yeah, hold on a minute. Let me just double check here. Um, yeah, so we don't we don't specify which exact files. We do say change all specifications that include the version string, so that should automatically include it. All right, cool. So it should be good. So no change needed there. All right. Any other questions or comments on this one? I have a question.
question. So is this minimum length? Is it mandatory field? If there's a string type, which you know uh, is vacant with the length could be zero or what? Yeah, hold on. Let me show you what we're talking about here. Do, 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 spec. So let's go ahead and take to do the type string. Okay, so I believe what's happening here is every single attribute that is of type string, whether it's required or optional, I'm pretty sure they all say must be a non empty string. Okay, and all he's doing is adding that min length equal to one to, to, re to represent that. So let's see whether I think string. Yeah, but that's per that, so that's right, non-empty. I think that's it. So actually, we don't have any optional, quote, string types per se, other than content type, which is further constrained by RFC 2046. So it is just for the required fields. Um, but it doesn't matter whether it's, the, the fact that it's required is not really relevant. All the, all the strings are non-empty. Does that help you, Kathy? So that means, you know, for all the string type, the user must define this minimum length. If, if they're gonna have the property there at all, then yes, it must be non-empty. This avoids the problem of, well, does not being there mean the same thing as an empty string or not? It, we avoid that entire problem. So if you're gonna specify the value, then you have to give at least, a not, a, at least one character. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just, okay, I'm just thinking, you know, if you define the string type, yeah, the user can define a non-zero um, value, non-zero string, right? Right. Um, okay, okay, I think that's fine. Yeah, here I just say the length, okay, yeah, okay. thanks. Any other questions or comments on this one? Sorry, just to come back to the version number, actually. Uh, yep. So is it meant for everybody to use a snapshot of a release version or a release commit of this spec, because that means like every single event that is validated with this spec must have version 0.2. It doesn't support any other versions. That is an excellent question. Does const mean that that's the only value it can be? I guess it must be because it's a constant. I mean, it must. Yeah, I'm wondering if, if maybe it should have been default if there, even, if there isn't even such a flag. Um, that's an interesting question. So let's, can you do me a favor? Can you ask that on this and we won't resolve it right now? We'll wait till we get an answer. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, so that's an excellent question. Any other questions or concerns on this one? Okay, so we'll hold off on that one. Okay, cool. Moving forward then. Swapping out, <clears throat> excuse me, swatching out uh, content type for, I believe it's data content type. We talked about this one last week and then Clemens convinced us all of the brilliance of keeping the word content in there. So it's not just data type anymore. <clears throat> so I went through and made the change last week. Any questions or concern on this one? Okay, any objection to the change? Going once, because it is a name change. I'll make sure everybody's okay with it. All right, we are done. And I will send out a note to the group for alerting people of that. Oops. Okay, cool, thank you very much. Uh, Christoph. Now this one, I think you made some changes either today or yesterday, so maybe a little too soon to vote on it. However, I do think it's important to talk about the changes you made so people can understand where you're headed with this and have a brief discussion about it, that's okay. Yeah, so for uh, context, uh, last week we approved the PR that said the spec itself, the main spec, doesn't specify how batching is done but HTTP or transport bindings in general uh, uh, can define if and how they want to do batching. And this pull request where they discussed last week 
Um, it tries to implement batching for HTTP. Um, so last week we discussed a little and we decided that uh, we want to have it similar to the um, structured mode in that it works with event formats. So the change I did compared to last week is that I moved the uh, basically the JSON array into the JSON uh, format file and then referenced it from the HTTP transport binding. So in the future, if there's a different format than JSON that wants to support batching, um, that can also be used with this new batched mode. Um, yeah, otherwise we can go through the whole bar if that makes sense. Um, the only uh, maybe thing I thought about when writing this is that I feel if you can maybe scroll down a little to the JSON itself. Um, I think the JSON format is, um, it's further down. The JSON format is kind of one, and then the batch form basically um, the second. Sorry, uh, if you scroll up a little bit again. In the second paragraph of the intro, um, saying although the JSON batch format builds on top of the JSON format, it is considered a separate format. A valid implementation of the JSON format doesn't need to support it. Um, so I'm not sure if it should really go into the same file as the JSON format or if it should be its own file to really make that distinction more clear that they should really be considered separate formats. Apart from that, I'm pretty happy with it, I think. Okay. Any questions for Christoph on this one? I like the change a lot. Okay, that's good. Um, and I'll, um, so instead of having a vote on this today, which is because it's rather large, um, I would try to kind of carve out um, some time uh, um, between now and the next call to actually go and implement that in the in the C sharp SDK to see whether I find issues with it. But I mean, it looks good. That would be excellent if you could do that. Yeah, I was. That's that's what I'm, I would be trying to do. Just go and validate that, that with implementation. Yep. Oh, no. it's because it's chunky it's a chunky the chunkiest change that we've had for for a while uh, christian were you going to say something in there or maybe it's christoph somebody uh, i wanted to say that it's that it sounds good that's great if uh, clemens gets around to implement it that would really validate that it works yep okay it seems fairly straightforward when i looked at it this morning but i didn't give a deep dive into it. Um, anybody on the call have any other, any questions or concerns with headed this direction? Just want to point out we do have a new content type, which makes sense. All right, last chance. Anybody have any other questions, comments? Like it. All right, in that case, um, okay, first of all, Kathy, can you go on mute? I think you might be hearing your typing. Thank you. Oh, all right. Yep, not a problem. Um, okay, so please, everybody, uh, review that. Um, hopefully, we can approve it on next week's call unless people find something uh, wrong with it. But I think that'd be a good step forward. Thank you. And then, Christoph, you have another one here. Do, 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 do. Yeah, this one we also talked about last week. The basic issue is that uh, um, there are limitations on all sorts of technologies that we use. Um, so we better define, well, we kind of settle on, we want to define a minimum event size that everyone has to support. So as a sender, if I'm sending an event that is smaller than the certain size we're going to settle on, then everybody has to accept it. Otherwise, they're not a valid cloud event implementation. So the um, text itself is kind of small. We also, I think it's a fairly small change. Um, one thing we can discuss is the actual size. So I kind of recommend 256 kilobytes, uh, but I don't have a strong opinion on this one. 
Okay, what do people think about this one? No comments? What do people think about the size? Too big, too small? Are there gonna be some consumers out there that really that can't handle something that large? I would imagine that most constraints from uh, for things wanting to be really, really small might be more on the producer side than the consumer side, but. Yeah, an Arduino can deal with that. Yeah. But I think that's mostly producer, even though, you know, but, but we can't make it fit in Arduino. So, you know, it's, <laughs> that's kind of, that's kind of difficult. Yeah. Okay. Now we're not going to put on today. It's a, I think it's too soon or too new one, but, uh, Please look it over when you get a chance. So the other thing that also uh, Tapani brought up um, two weeks ago um, is that it has an influence on the HTTP binary mode. Um, so if we just say the event can be up to 256 kilobytes, it's uh, they easily can consume more kilobytes in header data than what most HTTP servers accept. So it basically means that a lot of implementations will not or will have troubles implementing it validly. Um, so I was wondering if we want to change. So right now it says um, you should support both the HTTP binary and the HTTP structured mode. Um, so one way would be to say you should support a structured mode and you may support the binary mode. Another option will be to figure out if somehow sender and receiver can agree what the size should be, but it's a bit tricky. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask about this because 256 kilos sounds good for the event, but the metadata around the actual data of the event, we will have problems with HTTP implementations if it's, I mean, if people just end up putting most of their things there instead of inside data because with the uh, binary <laughs> mode, the headers can't be more than eight kilobytes, basically, and more than 100 attributes. So it's interesting that you're talking about messages up here, but then they may reach a cloud events above this size. E um, yeah. I think it's a bit um, difficult to measure the size of the cloud event itself. So I'm <clears throat> so I'm I'm trying to measure it by transforming the event itself into a message in the JSON format, and then using that size as the way to measure the size of the cloud event. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether this cloud event right here should be message. Because as it currently stands, people may say, oh, okay, 256K applies to the entire message. But down here, it kind of implies, well, maybe 256 applies to the cloud event itself and not the entire message. Yeah, we, yeah, I, yeah, it makes sense. Let's be, let me make that change. Okay. Anybody else have any other comments, concerns, or questions on this? I think it's good to find the size. I think this is really, this is a good thing to do. We need this. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, hi, else? this is Vladimir. Uh, yeah, I have mixed feelings about the size. On one side, I see uh, defining the standard that can be easily followed, but uh, in practice, I'm afraid that we will hit some edge cases. And the question is, what do we do then? What do we do if we have uh, such cases where the size turns out to be uh, uh, larger and it may be valid in a particular problem domain. So I don't, I don't have answer to that, but uh, maybe if you could have some kind of a pass or a policy, what do we do uh, when the size does not match? Thanks. You said when the size is larger, did you mean when the size is smaller? Because this is just defining the minimum size that someone has to accept. Yes, yes. Oh, I mean, when the messages are larger yeah. and, and there is a justification in the domain for them to be that way. Yes, um, I think the first thing is that we settle on 
this not being a, a hard limit, but it's just like a guarantee on a size. So you can always go above this limit. And if you sort of control all parts of your system, then you can make sure that all parts of your system accept messages that are larger. So if you know I'm putting my cloud events into Kafka and I know Kafka accepts one megabyte and you yourself um, sort of have validated that everything will work, then it will be fine. Um, this is the one answer. And the second answer is um, that we will have a follow-up PR that also um, Jim Day from PayPal asked for, is that we are um, going to build the claim check pattern, or at least I'm going to open a PR that implements the claim check pattern um, on cloud events. So basically what it is, <clears throat> it is um, you send an event, you would send all the metadata as you would before, but you would not include the payload to data object. Instead, you would say, okay, my payload is too big, but here's the way for you to get this payload anyway. Um, so this is also commonly used in other well, systems. I think this is a good pattern to implement. Um, and then hopefully uh, we have SDKs and so on that can kind of automate this process. Um, so it gets a bit hidden from the consumer. Does that make Sounds sense? Good. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Um, just because I think we're, we have way too much time on the call now since we're getting to the bottom of the agenda, let me just pick on one person in particular, um, Austin, since we haven't talked to you in such a long time. Let me pick on you for a sec. Um, in your experience, since I think uh, you've, you've interacted with lots of different clouds being, you know, given, given, given your product, do you see any concerns with this size limitation as a minimum? Uh, I'm not up to date on what the size limits are for all the various fast products out there. Wasn't there uh, an issue with the, with the list? Can't remember. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure at the top of my head, Doug. Uh, okay. I'll, just, uh, I'll have to look into it to follow okay. up. Okay. That's fine. I was just curious that you might have something. Uh, issue 257. Ah. At the top. Oh. oh, there we go. Yeah, so this is the list that I compiled from things that I interacted with mostly. So it's maybe not the most complete list ever. Um, but Lambda has recently, uh, as I wrote there, recently increased the limits to 256 kilobytes. So uh, with the exception of uh, Azure Event Grid, uh, everyone is at or above 256 kilobytes. So what does it then mean if we've, if we mandate that you have to support at least 256, but then there are some that are to the maximum at 256. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is listing out the maximum and we're considered the minimum. I'm not sure, like, that doesn't seem like it answers the question, right? It sounds like it actually might get into a weird it situation. <laughs> um, I mean, it does in the sense that, for example, in the case of event grid, you couldn't pass a valid um, like 100 kilobyte cloud event through it. Well, it's interesting, actually, I guess we should say, the text here doesn't say you can't have something smaller, but it just says you have to accept messages up to that size, at least that size. But then for somebody like this who has a maximum size of that, it seems like... I, I think, you know, I think this um, PR is about that, you know, any consumer should accept the messages up to that size. Um, if it's larger than that size, then you know the consumer of the event can reject that message. I, I well, think it's, it's cool to have a size for that because you know if it's if we do not set a limit, it could be huge, and just uh, transport the message it takes a long time. The latency is another consideration in the serverless um, application. So I think, you know, of course, you know, the, the actual size 
whether it's 256K or it's one meg or it's 128, that, that we can discuss, but I think it's good to set a size. So, so since event grid is um, our thing, um, the principle that lies behind the event grid just supporting 64K is that we're basically, we're forcing with that um, all the publishers to think about, you know, pointing back to the source of the, the events and basically like get details here and encourage them to um, just include effectively uh, metadata like the, enough descriptive information in also including in the body that is um, sufficient to uh, say what what just happens, but then give them a link so that if they need to go and dig further, um, they go to the original source. Like if the, the address of a customer change, um, the, the, the mailing address, then it's actually not right to go and include all that personally identifiable data in that event, but rather just give a link and then you have to go and fetch that data yourself. So that's kind of the rationale behind this. That's why we make this so small. Um, the, um, and obviously there are, there are the architectural uh, co uh, consequences from, from having a constraint like this. But um, I think, so 128K, which was the proposal last week, I don't think that would um, uh, make things really bad. 256K, that's, that's something else. So does this mean that event grid cannot be cloud event compliant? Mm. It means that if we set that limit to 256K, um, that must be supported, that it'll be a little bit more difficult for us. Um, that's literally a discussion that I would have to, I would have to have and I will, will then have with um, 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 my dev manager this week okay. to say, you know, how far can we reasonably push this? Um, because that actually has, has impact. I mean, it, ultimately, it's not going to be like this that everybody is starting to send maxed out messages. Um, but then we would have to go and support the occasional one. And then the question is, you know, how bad can that possibly be? Yeah. And um, it's simply a discussion I should have before I say anything um, or agree. That's something that's, that's a discussion I should have. And then if I get a no with a reason, then I should come back to you and tell you what that reason looks like. Okay, makes sense. Hey, Clemens, does EventGrid have uh, some type of dead letter queuing capacity or uh, retries automatically built in? Um, so retries it does. Um, if it can't find, um, if it can't deliver the message, then it, uh, it has an automatic back off. So it, it just keeps hitting whatever the, the target is until it gets a 200 um, class response code. Uh, dead lettering is something that we just added. So there's a, um, effectively an associated storage account. And um, we, messages that we can't deliver, we basically drop into that storage account. Yeah, okay. And then you can obviously have another grid looking at that storage account, et cetera. And are, are there any limits for the, the payload size in, in, those, in that storage account, in that storage option? Um, what do you mean? I mean, how much can be dead letters? Yeah, for individual payload sides. So there's oh, one way to look at this, and that's like the, what the size of the payload that the FAS product can accept. But then also a lot of these FAS products have retry functionality built in and maybe some dead letter queue functionality. Mm -hmm. So AWS Lambda, for example, for an asynchronous event invocation, it automatically has two, two retries. Yeah. Um, and dead letter queuing option available, and that's built on SQS, which has that 256 kilobyte limit. So uh, that's, oh, no, probably, no, that's no. where that limit comes from. So it's something else we should look into to answer this question. That is these, not just what- Yeah, we don't have an interaction like this. Like we have a gate at this, at like if you give us an event, we're enforcing the limit. Like you can't give us an event that's bigger than this. Mm -hmm. And then and then you we, we pass that through, we do a request, um, and if you give us a five, if you give us an error, I think we will keep trying for for a while. And if you, I think if you give us a five hundred, 
will will fail earlier and then go dead letter, but dead letter is effectively just writing that into storage account and that's of you know, virtually unlimited size, at least for, for those sorts of messages. So there's no further constraint where stuff can get stuck just because it gets like, you put something very large in here and then it can't be dead letter because the dead letter mechanism doesn't have enough capacity. Like that mechanism, that problem can't, it can't happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, just just another dimension to this problem is that mm -hmm. a lot of people have some some storage mechanism that helps them do retries. A lot of these fast products come with retries yeah. built in. Yeah, we we do the retries through um, effectively run event it runs on a service fabric ring and everything that's um, um, we have a we have our own queuing mechanisms inside of event grid um, that's completely fail safe. And so all these queues are replicated in the cluster and blah, blah, blah. So there's a whole internal mechanism that's behind this. And that's backing up the, the retry mechanism. Like you can literally shoot down half of the cluster um, while we're do doing deliveries and retries and we keep the counts right. Yep. By the way, does the, have we had any discussions um, around putting in retry functionality into the, the context of the event, the metadata of cloud events? I don't recall anything coming up in that space. No, not yet. No, not yet. Okay. Yeah, it might be an interesting uh, feature optimization uh, later down the road. Sounds like an extension. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Right. All right. So a little uh, bit. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to point out, um, like Christoph, if you do go for the claim check pattern. Um, you were talking about metadata still being included in the event, then you will end up anyway uh, separating the metadata and the actual data of the event into different sizes for the claim check pattern. And uh, then I don't see a reason why they wouldn't be limited separately anyway. Well, the, um, well, I think that gives you an option if you have, let's say your payload is, I don't know, 200 kilobytes and your metadata is 100 kilobytes, which it really shouldn't be. Uh, well, then it kind of gives you the option of still sending 100 kilobytes of metadata and then sending the payload, not sending the payload, but having the claim check pattern for it. Um, so in the end, what you could end up with is really 256 kilobytes bytes of metadata is sort of the worst case that this ends up being then. Yeah, that's true. Okay, I think we've reached the end of the discussion on this one, unless somebody has something else to, that they'd like to bring up. It sounds like people need to go off and think about this more and do some investigation. Any last minute discussion points on this one? Okay, so we will revisit this next week. Thank you, Christoph, very much for that. And I think that's it in terms of open PRs. Uh, what I wanted to briefly do was to talk about our roadmap for a sec. Because for version three, do, 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 do. Um, the, the, this one is obviously something we'll, we'll just get to as we look through the list of open PRs and stuff. Um, but I really wanted to focus on though was security related issues. Now, I went through a list of the open issues today and these are the three that I thought related to, were uh, related to security. And what I'd like to do is start having some discussions around these to one, decide whether there are other aspects related to security that we want to, um, to deal with in the spec in a 1.0 timeframe and to get people to start thinking about these issues in particular out here and start getting some discussions going to see if we want to close them with no action or open up a PR to actually address the issue brought up in the, or the, the concern brought up in the issues. Okay. So I don't necessarily want to discuss these here today, let people go off and read these on their own but please be thinking about the security related concerns that have been mentioned in the past and please bring them up um, either as new issues or if you feel strongly about one of these issues right here, go ahead and open up a pull request to, to try to address it. Um, now I should point out that in the past, we tagged the second one as not required for version one. And I'm okay with that, but I think you guys should look it over to make sure everybody's still okay with it and not being resolved in the version one timeframe. Um, so anyway. Please get a chance to look at these and think about security in general, because uh, yeah. that is a requirement for version 0 0.3. Yes, go ahead, Tim. Hi, yeah, and I'm not sure if it's in scope, but in terms of like whether uh, 
in the cases where a publisher might want to have the data encrypted, do we want to have some discussions around that or recommendations? You know, where it, you know the event data may uh, traverse through a pipeline, and middleware might not want to, you know they may not want the middleware to be uh, able to inspect the data. Yeah, I think I actually think that has come up in the past. I just can't remember where we landed with it, other than yeah, it's something to think about. But my first thought was, you must be new here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> Relatively, yes. Um, uh, so my standard answer to this is, um, I would try to avoid this for uh, as long as we can. OK. Um, out of historical context, uh, because the last time um, uh, something had good momentum and kind of had an interoperability standard that was kind of built on abstraction like this, started adding security that ended up sinking the ship. And I would like to um, avoid that complication because that gets very bad very fast and rather figure out a way how we can uh, externalize the problem by saying, you know, using use JSON web encryption or something else like as a note, but not be too specific about it. Because as soon as you drag that all, all that context into here, uh, it gets it gets really hard. Um, if you look at, so J JSON web encryption, if you look at the entire specs at Josie or Josie, JWE, et cetera, they're in IETF. Um, I don't. I frankly don't see a lot of uptake on this. And the precursor was W Security um, for SOAP. Um, and it, it's it's a very complicated set of things to do end-to-end -end encryption. And they add a ton of weight um, because doing that sort of end-to-end -end security requires a, a ton of negotiation of parameters, of algorithms. Um, you need to do a bunch of handshaking to make it even work. We're having here a one-way mechanism, so we can't even negotiate session tokens. So it gets it gets really hard, um, and it becomes kind of a multi-year exercise in how are we even going to go and do this. And um, that's why I'm kind of in favor of let us make let us get to 1.0 without end-to-end -end encryption. And if then there's some folks who really can't live without end-to-end -end encryption, then let's go and take a look at it. Sure, thanks. It's, thanks just, it's just it's just it's just so really so hard end-to-end -end, uh, that I'm just afraid of it, just because it, it's going to it's going to it's going to dominate this call. It's going to dominate the work for you know, probably a year, it's going to delay 1.0 indefinitely. And that's why I don't want it. So yeah. I put some notes into the, um, into the agenda or the, the, yeah, the meeting notes, whatever you call it. Um, Cause whether the group agrees with Clemens's opinion there or not is something we need to actually discuss at some point. Yes. And I think it would be worthwhile to formalize that discussion a little bit more. So what I'd like to do is I'll open up an issue to at least uh, get the discussion going, and then Clemens, you can put down everything you just said in there into the issue, so we have some historical context for people to go back and read. I'll be happy to reset the entire history of W security. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then what we can do is, let's say for example, we decide not to actually add something to the spec at this time. I do think it would be worthwhile to add something to the primer to explain why we chose to defer it at this time, just so people can understand our reasoning, because our primer doc is supposed to be. Um, uh, informational purposes for people to understand why we made the decisions we did. And this is obviously going to be a very important decision for people to understand. So I, that, I think if nothing else, that issue will lead to a change to the primer doc, but we can hold off on that and figure out uh, what we want to do later, whether it's PR the spec or just update the primer. But Tam, I do, I will open up an issue for that discussion. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. There, there's one other aspect of this and that's, we have this great extensions concept. Right, where people could start experimenting with different kind of in encryption methodologies and security methods and stuff via extensions. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the big goals in my mind for extensions and any type of plugin architecture is when you're bringing a product to market, you always want to you know kind of focus on the MVP, keep it pretty lean, 
Um, and you just want to get it in the hands of users right away so that they can start using it and they'll actually teach you about your product. And the one great thing that extensions and any plugin architecture provides is that as long as there's an easy way to extend the thing and add functionality to it, users will start doing that and they'll start creating extensions, creating plugins, and then you'll start seeing demand uh, increase for the plugins that you know, are really solving important problems. And what this shows is basically it just guides you as to what should be in the core eventually. Yeah. Um, so I recommend we, you know, we, we keep thinking about that. We keep trying to get this, keep this thing lean, get it out to the market, get it in the hands of users and make sure that there's a, a straightforward way to extend it. And, you know, a place where people can post their extensions uh, and we can keep an eye on them because when some of those take off, it's a clear signal from the market that that thing may yeah. need to be for. And I can I can imagine I can imagine an extension that says that defines a few fields and says here's an initialization vector, here's you know a pointer to a key, um, or a reference to a key of, of some sort, um, crypto algorithm, HMAC algorithm, and then uh, the, the 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 data of the event becomes and the content type that's point but points to it. It says encrypted data, blah blah blah, and that's how you then express an encrypted, one-way encrypted event um, in a particular way of how that one extension can go and, and handle it. Right, Which so is much, much easier than trying to make it, make, create a model that works for everything under all circumstances where we have to go and, and, and deal with um, all the complications that come with that. Right, so we have a couple people with their hands up. Uh, I don't know who was first, but Christoph, you're first on, as I see it. Yeah, so more. My question to Tom is, are you talking about the payload or also about the metadata? So uh, just own, the payload. To, just the payload, okay. Because then it, like, there is technically nothing that stops you from encrypting it, right? So the right. consumer reads the event type and kind of has to understand what will, what will I get anyway? So I think it, uh, yeah, I think it's sort of, Implicitly, if you control both the producer and consumer, you can do that. Or right, definitely. I, I just wondered if we wanted to put some recommendations around the, you know, the the specifics of the encryption. Yeah, well, definitely. I think it's worthy discussion to have to see what how people feel about it. So we can we can get that going. And Vlad, I think you're next. Uh, yeah, also as some history on this, we also got into encrypted payloads when we were discussing extensions and whether we wanted a bag or not. And that went down a rabbit hole with whether we wanted extensions to also be encrypted. And if we wanted to guarantee the event wasn't tampered with and stuff like that. And it went really <laughs> down a rabbit hole as far as I remember. And that's when we decided that no, we're not gonna consider it really seriously for 1.0 but I might be remembering this wrong. It does, it does sound painfully familiar, yes. <laughs> okay, um, so anyway, please be thinking about security. We need to get at least the issues identified so we know exactly what we need to tackle for uh, 0 0.3, because I think that is probably the biggest work item for 0 0.3 is the security related ones. We've already started to look at some of these other things down here, um, but to be honest, when I look at these, I think these are smaller in scale or, or complexity relative to possible security related ones. So I'd like to get security ones uh, going first on our plate. So be thinking about that. Open up issues for new things you can think of and we'll get those discussions going. Okay. Is there anything else related to the security or 0 0.3 roadmap that you guys would like to discuss before we move forward? So what is your rough timetable for 0 0.3 will be also the next KubeCon? Uh, I act honestly, I personally have not thought about that. I mean, if we can make it for KubeCon, I think that'd be great. I think it all depends on whether we get through like the security related issues. I could, like I said, I think the other ones are relatively small. So if we could, if we could put security behind us, I think, I think 0 0.3 would be, would be, uh, not too far after that. But that's just my opinion. I want to move as quickly as possible though. <laughs> Okay, anything else? 
Okay, uh, we don't have a whole lot of time, so I just wanted to draw people's attention to these three issues here. Um, these are just ones that I personally thought were interesting. Obviously, people are free to add items to the agenda as they see fit. Um, but I thought these are interesting because they potentially either add new attributes or could change uh, or have normative changes to the spec um, in, in non-trivial ways. So uh, please, when you get a chance, I think at least the first two are probably the more interesting ones. Um, this one, the last one about deprecated events, I think that might actually just be an extension, but I'd like to get people's opinion on that to see whether it's something that they're okay with leaving as an extension for later or whether they actually think it should be in, in 1.0. But if nothing else, I think Clemens, if, if you could take a look at the first one in particular, I thought that one might pique your interest. Okay, and, that, and so I may try to force discussions on these sooner rather than later. Just want to give you guys a heads up. Is that, um, is that from Alan Conway, the first one? Uh, it might be. That sounds familiar. Hold on. Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Yes, there you go. Okay, because that sounds like an issue for me. All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. With that, I think we're at the end of the agenda. Are there any other topics people would like to bring up? All right. Not hearing any. Let me just do last minute roll call then. Richard, are you there? Richard? Yeah. Yes, I am. Yeah. Excellent. And Michael, Michael Payne? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Renato? I think I may have spelled that right. Renato? Yes, I'm here. Okay, excellent. And Vladimir, did we hear from you? I can't remember. I apologize. Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay. Is there anybody else I'm missing from the agenda or from the attendee list? All right. In that case, you guys get back a whole five minutes of your day. Thank you very much for a very productive call. I appreciate it. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thanks, everyone. Doug, uh, I um, updated the PR. Right. Oh, it's a penny. Okay, cool. Excellent. I'll take a look at that and, and get that merged. Thank you very much. No problem. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.